Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dorota Lembrer, and I am a Young Researchers Representative in the uh, ERMI board. I, together with Andrea Mafia and Dylan Sahir Gur, uh, are organizing the uh, webinars for Young Researchers. Today, we are welcoming you to our second webinar, where Uffe Thomas Jankvist will be our presenter. Uh, to begin with, a few, a few general informations, so you are all uh, informed about the procedures and the way we are going to, to, to work during those coming one and a half hours. It's very important for you to know that this webinar will be recorded, or we already have started the recording. Uh, for, the, uh, for, for, for young researchers who would like to uh, attend and listen to, to Ufes uh, uh, webinar later, and that all the, the, the content of the webinar will be uh, available on our YouTube channel. The time frame is uh, 60 minutes for, of presentation and then 30 minutes for the, the discussion in between and at the end of, of the session. Uh, we are going to share the files with you. You can find them um, uh, find them already here and later at our YouTube channel. Uh, the content of the webinar will be available uh, and a few a few other materials later. If you do have any questions you would like to to to, to post to to Ufa during his presentation, you are very welcome to to write your question in a field which is available on the left side of your screen. Uh, this is a small window called questions. You can distinguish your questions, which me uh, means that uh, our technical supporter behind the scene, Dylan, sh she will be able to forward those questions to Ufa. Uh, during the presentation, you can do that. Uh, you can also uh, uh, post discussion questions, so any, any ger general questions for discussion at the time of the presentation. Uh, so, which means that uh, by the end of the session, Ufa can can answer uh, answer all your questions too. Uh, it um, so if you look at the uh, the, the other uh, place on your screen, that you will also see. Uh, many links to our, uh, which are Yermi specific, which I, uh, many of you might be already familiar with. So a warm welcome to our presenter, Ufe Tumas Jankvist, who is a professor with special responsibilities in mathematics education at the Danish School of the Education, Aarhus University. Ufe is a director of PhD program of didactics at the School of Art in, uh, at Aarhus University and visiting professor in mathematics education at Uppsala University. Many, many of you might have uh, met Uffe at a CERMI conference in the previous years. Uh, Uffe has been a chair for the thematic working group at, at conferences way back. Uh, the thematic working group that Uffe was uh, chair for was, is the history of mathematics education. He has been also chair for a thematic working group on implementation of research in uh, <coughs> implementation of research. Uh, Uffe is an editor for the uh, Nordic uh, Studies in Mathematics Education, one of the journals which is included in the in the overview. Uh, uh, of the journals he's going to talk about. His research in interest is histor history of his use of history in mathematics education, as students learning difficulties in math education, also technology, and in implementation of research in math education. As you can hear, his uh, research is uh, within mathematics education is including uh, many areas. So, well, welcome to Ufa Thomas Jan Christ as our presenter for the webinar today. The floor is yours. Okay, well, thank you very much, Dorota. Um, 
So I take it that uh, the sound goes through, right, Dylan? Um, <clears throat> what I would like, I would like to see my slides now, actually. Is that possible? Perfect. Okay, hello everybody. Thank you for joining this uh, webinar today. Um, so, what I want to talk about is Mathematics Education Research Journal and the review procedures. But before that, I'd like to thank Yami for giving me this opportunity uh, for giving this webinar and also sharing with you some of the insights that I, uh, for one at least, would have liked to have known back when I was myself a young researcher in this field. <clears throat> so some of the motivation behind doing this webinar uh, and also uh, previous uh, workshops at Jeremy Days together with my colleague Mario Sanchez Aguilar um, is that as a doctoral student you're often not told what mathematics educa education journals actually exist, what are the review procedures for these journals, how do things work, and how are the journals different from each other, what kind of papers are they interested in, and also how are they ranked. So I'd be touching upon some of these uh, issues as we go along uh, today. The talk will be divided into three parts. First, an overview of uh, some selected mathematics education journals and their review procedures. Uh, after that, we'll have a session of questions. Um, the second part is on how to potentially choose the journal to where you would like to send a research paper. And finally, what to do when you get your reviews. So the first part. So there are several attempts uh, to rank and classify journals in mathematics education research. A couple of years ago, there was a, a long study presented in JRME, which is uh, interesting to look at. Um, but today we shall take our departure point in a European ranking from 2012. This was done by the Education Committee of the European Mathematical Society uh, and the Executive Committee of the European Society for Research in Mathematics Education, that is ERMI, where you are young researchers, and also the International Commission for Mathematical Instruction. If you are not uh, familiar with the Education Committee, you might want to check out um, their solid findings papers, which you can also find on the web page. That's just a little bit of side information. But the interesting thing about this ranking is that it is based on uh, expert judgment. So it's not a lot of citations or, or whether or not the journals are included in databases. It's actually more what do the mathematics education researchers themselves think about these journals. In particular, four criteria, criteria were listed. Recognition of the journal, review process and quality standards, the editors and editorial boards, and citation, well, to some extent. So what they did was that they asked 75 experts to rank uh, a list of selected journals with these four grades, A star, A, B, and C. And the expert could also propose journals that they thought uh, that was not on the list or that they thought should be on the list. So this resulted in a list of 17 journals. Uh, and we'll have a look at some of these uh, in order to give you an insight into which kind of journals are there. 
So the top scores in this ranking were educational studies in mathematics. I suppose you know this one. It's a European journal created by Hans Freudenthal in 1968. And then the Journal for Research in Mathematics Education, JRME, which is also an old journal published by the NCTM. It stems back to 1970. Then the, the next category of journals were for the learning of mathematics, Journal of Mathematical Behavior, Journal of Mathematics Teacher Education, Mathematical Thinking and Learning, and ZDM. So I will not spend a lot of time talking about ZDM because it's only invited special issues. So you cannot actually submit a paper to this journal yourself without being invited. The next category of B journals were International Journal of Mathematics, Education and Science and Technology, IJMST, International Journal of Science and Mathematics Education, Mathematics Education Research Journal, the French Journal, which I cannot really pronounce probably, so I will just call it RDM. And then finally, Research in Mathematics Education. The last category of journals included the Canadian Journal of Science and Mathematics and Technology Education, the German Journal für Mathematik Didaktik, the Nordic Studies in Mathematics Education, and then a journal that uh, researchers in mathematics education used to publish in, but not necessarily so much anymore, technology, knowledge, and learning. And finally, uh, the Montana Mathematics Enthusiast. So, we're going to attempt to have a small poll. Which of these 17 journals did you already know? Please provide your answers in this box on the left. So we'll just wait a few seconds. To see what you are answering. I think we can now broadcast the results. Is that working, Dylan? OK. <clears throat> so all of you know educational studies in mathematics. Most of you also JRME. About half of you are familiar with Journal of Mathematical Behavior, Journal of Mathematics Teacher Education. Most of you know ZDM. And then A lot of you know RME, and also the Nordic one. But for the others, it's around a third or so, it seems. OK. But you shouldn't be too sad about that, because in the list that the researchers were provided with, there were also journals that the researchers didn't necessarily know, that you can read in the uh, in the paper in EMS. So let's talk a little bit about the review procedures of some of these journals. So and what kind of papers they accept. So educational studies in mathematics accepts a variety of different types of articles. You will find empirical papers there, qualitative and quantitative. But you'll also find more theoretical papers, philosophical papers, historical papers, uh, a lot of things that you will not necessarily find in many of the other journals. Uh, educational Studies in Mathematics is also one of the few journals that have a one-way blind review. So this means that you put your name on the manuscript, and the reviewers can see your name. In most other journals, this is not uh, the case. There you have a two-way blind review. 
the manuscripts are usually sent to, uh, to three reviewers. It seems that these days they have a, a fair, so we had Arthur Bakker here uh, the previous time. And my recent experiences with uh, educational studies in mathematics is that uh, the review procedure runs fairly smoothly. I mean, you submit your paper and you hear back from them in a reasonable amount of time. Now next is uh, JRME. JRME has a tradition of being mostly interested in quantitative studies, but there are, of course, some exceptions. Um, they have a two-way blind review. Here, manuscripts are sent to four reviewers. Um, I think also you hear back fairly soon from JRME, uh, as far as I understand. This can change with changing editors over time, of course. Um, but it seems to be working quite well presently. Now, if you should ever reach the stage of having your manuscript accepted for JRME, and that is not uh, necessarily very easy, I mean, I believe that JRME has a very high rejection rate, actually, uh, but if you succeed, then your manuscript will pass through an editor for content, uh, an editor for language, an editor for APA style, and an editor for references. Um, I once experienced that uh, the editor for references found a spelling mistake in a Danish reference, uh, so that I was quite impressed by that, actually. But JRME has a rather rigid template that you must follow if you want to submit papers to this journal, so you should be aware of that. Journal of Mathematical Behavior. It's also an old journal in the field. It used to be called a Journal of Children's Mathematical Behavior for the first two volumes or so. And it is keen on both quantitative and qualitative studies. They also have a two-way blind review. And manuscripts are usually sent to three or four reviewers. JMT. Is yet another well-established journal. Of course, if you want to submit to this journal, your manuscript or your study must have a focus on mathematics teachers somehow. It is a two-way blind review. Manuscripts are sent to three reviewers. Uh, from my experience, uh, things are done very, very thoroughly, and it also takes a long time to to actually have a manuscript finally accepted for this journal. It's also not uncommon, and this can all, it's also the case in many of the other journals, that you can submit a manuscript and that it be accepted for major revision, but that it can be rejected at a later stage. For the learning of mathematics, personally, it's one of my favorite journals because it's uh, it has a different style than many of the other uh, journals. So, for a paper to go into this journal, it must adhere to what they call the special FLM spirit. And this means that the paper should not be too heavy on theory. There should be some data, but not a lot of data. So, you cannot do very large, big quantitative studies for, for this journal. Um, also, preferably, your manuscript or your, your paper could be a little bit controversial or a little bit provoking. Um, they also have a different uh, review procedure. So, FLM sends your paper to a group of readers. These are usually from the editorial board, I think. And based on their readings of your manuscript, they, the editor then decides whether or not this manuscript enters into review. If so, it is a, it used to be a two-way review process, but actually now that I think about it, the last one I reviewed, it was not. But um, usually it goes to two, maybe three reviewers. So, IJ missed 
It's also a journal that dates back to the 70s. Um, and this journal accepts uh, a quite wide variety of papers also uh, like uh, educational studies and mathematics do. It's a two-way blind review process. Papers are usually sent to two reviewers. And one interesting feature here is that you can suggest reviewers yourself. This you can also do in other journals, but you can, for IJMS, you can also suggest people whom you do not want to review your manuscript. I have not seen this uh, anywhere else. But it makes sense, actually, if some people have a, some researchers have a dispute about something. So maybe there are certain people they do not want to review their manuscripts. Then the International Journal of Science and Mathematics Education is a journal, of course, that publishes both studies in science and math education. So you should be aware of that. And for that reason, it also makes good sense for more interdisciplinary studies. Also, a journal like Mathematical Thinking and Learning is interested in interdisciplinary studies. Um, but here, I mean, interdisciplinary studies between mathematics and the sciences, are, of course, uh, make a lot of sense. It's also a two-way blind review, two to three reviewers. And here you can also suggest reviewers yourself. The French journal is surely also a well-respected journal. Uh, it publishes mainly in French, but it does also accept manuscripts in English. The thing here, of course, is that your paper must be connected somehow to the French tradition of didactics of mathematics, so that you either use some of the French theories in the work, in the manuscript, in your analysis that you send to this, or that you relate to discussions in the French community of mathematics education somehow. Again, the two-way blind review process, two, three reviewers. The Nordic Journal, this I know because uh, I used to be an editor for this, um, is like the German, an example of a regional journal. So if you want to submit papers to this uh, journal, the studies that you report on must have some kind of connection to the Nordic countries or by either using a Nordic framework or, of course, if you are from the Nordic countries, you, uh, you more or less do have a Nordic reference point, right? Or maybe you are staying, having your stay abroad as a young researcher in the Nordic countries. Then you can submit to this journal as well during that point in time. It is a two-way blind review, two to three reviewers. And usually, you get reviews back within six to eight weeks. And this was made a priority back in 2012, uh, exactly for that reason that young researchers should be able to submit to this journal. So now we come to the second question. We'll have a small poll about this. So approximately how many journals do you think there exist in mathematics education research? We'll take a few seconds to let you provide your answers. Okay, so before we discuss your answers there, let's uh, have a couple of more slides. So here are some examples of journals that did not make the EMS list. Here are some more examples. More examples. Some more examples, and some more examples, and some more examples. So I'm actually not sure how many journals there are in mathematics education, but the number of journals 
on these slides is uh, between 70 and 80, and I'm pretty sure that there are more than that. The researchers that participated in the EMS ranking were presented with 49 journals that they had to rank, um, and then they suggested uh, some 30 more, which are the ones you have seen on these slides. So, and out of these journals, there are, of course, also uh, many that have very decent review procedures. But there are also some journals um, that have more or less strange procedures where you feel fairly sure that it's probably only the editor who has read your manuscript and made a decision for acceptance or not, or which is also the case for other journals. But it shouldn't be the case that a peer-reviewed journal can accept uh, papers without sending them into actual review, at least. OK, so now we are ready to have some uh, questions from the participants. So we have one question that asks, how often is this ranking checked and updated? <laughs> so this ranking was done in 2012, and it has not been uh, updated since, I think. So, so there are journals that have probably been established later than that. I think one example might be uh, Digital Experiences in Mathematics Education. So that one is uh, not on the list. We have another question that asks, what would be acceptable time for a first answer? That is difficult to say, I think. Um, but it would be, well, we, we'll get back to this uh, discussion of, uh, of how long the response time is for journals later, but it's difficult to say what is an acceptable time, I think. Then we have a question here from Mario, who asks, what journal do you think a young researcher should try for the first time, and why? Well, I think it, uh, it differs depending on the study, right? Um, but for my own doctoral students, I usually encourage them to to submit a paper to the Nordic Journal and to participate in a workshop that they have for, for young authors. And yet a question that says, are there any math ed journals we young researchers need to be aware of not to publish in? Well, that's a difficult question, right, in particular when this uh, presentation is being recorded and will be put on YouTube. But um, the journals with a very slow response time and a very long turnover period is probably not a good idea for young researchers to publish in. But this, we will get, we will discuss this more in the third uh, part of the lecture. Are there any more questions? Should we then move on to the second part of the talk? I think we will do that. OK. So how do you choose a journal for your research paper? It is related to one of the questions that we just had, of course. And here is a new question for you to answer. Which criteria do you use when you decide which journal to submit a research paper to? So please, as we go along, just write in your answers in the box on the left.
And while you think of that and do that, I will uh, explore some possible criteria. So some of you might be subject to institutional requirements, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, some institutions require you to submit to journals that are indexed in certain ways. For instance, Social Science Citation Index, but not a lot of math education journals are there, actually. Or the SCI Journal Ranking, which is a Spanish initiative. Or in the Nordic, in Denmark and Norway, we have the, uh, the bibliometrics of the BFI lists. Maybe some of you have to publish in in journals that are indexed in the, some of, or that appear in some of the databases, etc. And if this is the case for you, then of course this narrows down uh, your options, right? So that's an easy way to do it. But if not, I mean, there are other things to consider. The journal's aims is, of course, always important to take into account. Um, Some of this we talked about in the first part, uh, but usually a journal on its website has a list of aims, and you should read that to see if your paper can fit into that, of course. Otherwise, it will simply just be rejected by the editor uh, without ever going into a review process. You might also want to check out the journal's editorial board because maybe you are referring to researchers uh, or rely on work of researchers who are a member of this board. And if that is the chance, or if that is the case, there is a chance that these people might be asked to review your manuscript. But in order to find out what type of papers a journal actually publishes, often the aims are not enough. Uh, it makes more sense to also browse through previous issues of the journal. So that's a good exercise to do that. Now, in a recent uh, paper by uh, Mons Nis in FLM, he talks about the very multifaceted nature of mathematics education research. Um, this paper is based on a presentation at the PME in Umeo. Uh, and which was last summer, um, and here he, he talks about what he refers to as an ideal typical journal paper. And such papers usually report on empirical uh, qualitative studies, which is the type of studies that many young researchers do, of course, and this is uh, perfectly okay. Um, but what is good to know is that some journals are not interested in such ideal typical papers. FLM, for once, is not. Whereas JRME mainly accepts such ideal typical papers. And uh, Nissi says that, I further claim that reviewers tend to strongly adhere to the template constituted by the ideal typical paper and explicitly criticize papers that deviate from it. And possibly he is right about this. I think he is, at least. And this is good to know when you are going to submit papers to journals. Another thing <coughs> that is uh, that you should be aware of is that different journals have different length limits. So educational studies, for instance, they now only accept papers of 8,000 words, including tables, figures, references, and everything. JRME, 12,000 words, but then tables, figures, and references comes on top of that. FLM has always been very short papers of 5,000 words. Mathematical thinking and learning can accept quite long papers of 40 pages, but then what is a page that you need to find out by looking at their template? Journal of Mathematical Behavior has no maximum mentioned. Uh, JMTE is 10,000 words, in excluding references. IJMS, no word limit. Uh, NOMA has 30,000 to 50,000 characters, uh, and so on and so forth. And why is this important? Well, 
For once, if you are a young researcher, you often do a literature review, and you possibly want to publish a paper based on your literature review. And it may be quite difficult to squeeze that into 8,000 words, uh, in particular since all the references uh, in ESM must be included in these. So that means that whereas it used to be the case that educational studies in mathematics published a lot of uh, literature reviews, maybe this is not the case to the same extent anymore as it used to be. Also, if you do empirical studies, um, it is difficult to report uh, shortly on these if you also include substantial accounts of your research design and your methodology, etc. So you may need to find a journal that actually publishes longer papers. And then time factor is an issue for PhD students. Um, probably you cannot wait a year or more to receive your reviews. And therefore, you may want to try to find out the turnover time of the manuscript for the journal that you are considering. Um, and just because, this you should be aware of, just because the journal used to have a long turnover, it may not necessarily be the case that it has this anymore because these things change when editors change. And even if your paper is accepted, for some journals it takes forever to actually publish them. And maybe you want to do a collection of papers in your dissertation, so it's difficult to maybe wait for that. So one, another potential criteria is to see if the journals actually publish papers online uh, before assigning them to issues. And then when you actually want to, or are ready to submit your paper, it is simply just a good idea to follow the guidelines. Because if you don't, if you don't uh, follow the style sheet of the journal, um, it may be sent back to you. And then it adds more time to the review procedure. Another good idea is perhaps when you browse the issues for a particular journal that you might be interested in, to see if there are relevant studies for you and then make some references to these studies in your paper. Um, and also, of course, remember to blind your paper if needed. Otherwise, they will possibly just send it back to you and that adds a few more days for you to do this, maybe. There's more assistance to, uh, to get on this topic. So, some editors have written about it. Uh, the English has a uh, chapter on towards called towards article acceptance avoiding common pitfalls and submissions to MTL and also you can find uh, what the editors of JRME consider to be characteristics of a highly qualitative JRME manuscript so now we have a further round of questions but let me just read some of these uh, answers that you gave to the previous uh, question. You mentioned index, visibility and indexation, expected time of publishing. Yes, we talked about that. Themes that the journal is addressing. Yes, that's the aims. The Nordic list. Yes, uh, when you are in the Nordic countries, you probably look at the Nordic list to see which journals are indexed in this. The aims for the journal, the topic of my research paper, journal ranking, yes. The scope, yeah, and the journal's aims and scope. Okay, so very good. So now, questions to the second part. There's a question here that asks, are there any predator journals? Of course there are. Um, there are journals where you are 
what you experience sometimes is that you are in the middle of submitting your paper and then when it's almost finished they ask you to pay right so that those type of journals there are uh, actual predator journals I'm not I'm not really sure about that but I'm positive that there is in math education there is uh, in practically uh, every field I think which journals are in social science citation index yeah well there are at least educational studies in mathematics and also the American JRME and also MTL they are there I'm not sure if there are um, other journals than those three the next question how far away does the actual study have to be from the time it was published for example, can someone publish about research that was conducted several years back? I think this is possible. Yes, you can do that. Um, but what you, of course, need to do is to make yourself familiar with the research that has been done in this area since you did your empirical study. And another question that says, what about open access journals in mathematics education? Should we, as an author, pay for this kind of journal? <coughs> well, so there are uh, some journals that are simply just open access. For instance, uh, ReadyMath is an open access journal. It has a, a normal a review procedure similar to what we discussed in part one. You don't pay uh, for this open access. You simply just, uh, your paper is simply just published online. And there are other journals that does these things. So the Nordic Journal, after two years, uh, there's free access to pretty much every, or to all manuscripts that are older than two years. Um, in some of the, the larger, more major journals published by publishing houses like Springer and Taylor and Francis, you can pay for open access. Some institutions do that uh, and other institutions don't. If you have the money, I think it's probably worthwhile because it makes your paper more accessible to, to other people from other parts of the world as well. Are there any further questions? Okay, so we move along to the third part of this webinar. What to do when you get your reviews. So there's a question for you here. For the last paper you submitted to a journal, what was the initial decision for this paper? As you can see, the possibilities are uh, acceptance uh, in its present form. I think this is uh, very, very rare that this uh, happens. Acceptance for publication with minor revisions. Acceptance for publication with major revision. Uh, worthy of reconsideration after major revision. Uh, which is more or less equivalent to revise and resubmit and then not acceptable for publication, which is, of course, rejection. So the way that it looks now is that more or less as anticipated that uh, most of you have gotten major revisions. And there are some of you <coughs> who have not yet uh, submitted a research paper. Yeah, so this is something I found on the internet. This is describes what it might feel like to actually have a paper accepted.
But yes, if manuscripts are accepted, then it is usually with major revision. Um, major revision can actually cover a broad range of changes needed in your manuscript. And it can vary a lot in terms of work effort, what is actually needed. So some major revisions concern rewriting of the manuscript, dealing with language issues. Uh, others to include new theoretical constructs and thus also reworking parts of your analysis. Uh, perhaps you're asked to account better for the methodology or to update references, etc., etc. Usually the sooner that you can send your revised version, the better. Because then sometimes the editor has a chance of using some of the same reviewers for your paper. The decision revise and resubmit uh, is given at least in my experience of being an editor for the Nordic Journal, if, if the reviewers and the editor actually do see a potential in the manuscript, but also believes, believe that there is still a long way to go before this manuscript reaches a, a state of uh, publication. Um, the revisions needed are deemed to be of such an extent that this paper or that this will result in a rather different paper. So, whereas a major revision can be regarded as the same paper, revise and resubmit is probably often seen as a, as a new paper from an editorial point of view. And even though it's not necessarily what you hoped for, I mean, it is not a rejection, revise and resubmit. You should keep that in mind. Now, once you begin submitting papers to journals and enter into the world of, uh, of publishing, you will experience that there are good reviews and there are certainly also uh, crappy reviews. Good reviews are typically reviews that are constructive. They provide advice on how to improve the manuscript. They point to strengths and weaknesses. Uh, and also something that is not unimportant. They actually do review the paper on the paper's own premises. Um, so the, <coughs> if you recall this quote from, from this about the ideal typical paper. So if you are submitting a paper that is a theoretical paper, for instance, and it is still reviewed as if it should have been or if, as if the reviewer wanted it to be an ideal typical paper, then this reviewer is not reviewing the paper on the paper's own premises. So, and that I think is not necessarily a very good review. So for crappy reviews, I mean, there can be a lot of different reasons or a lot of different types of crappy reviews. I mean, one thing is, of course, that the reviewer didn't do his or her job. I mean, it's very short, or uh, you can see that they haven't actually read the paper, or um, quite often you see that they think that more empirical data is needed, maybe even despite the fact that this paper sets out to be theoretical, or to focus on design aspects, or uh, comparisons of uh, curricula, or whatever, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, another type of review that is not very interesting is a review that spends most of the time pointing out how you do not adhere to APA style in your reference list. This is something that, that of course, should be okay and it can be fixed, right? But, I mean, it doesn't really say much about the study reported on. So what is the role of the editor in all this? Well, in my experience, a good editor provides advice to the author on how to actually do the needed revisions, based on the review reports, of course. And a good editor does not necessarily agree with the reviewers in all respects, but tells the authors which revisions are absolutely needed and which are not necessarily needed but could be taken into consideration. One of the worst scenarios you can experience as, a, as an author is 
if an editor simply just forwards you three review reports, and these review reports are uh, saying completely different things and asking for completely different uh, types of re revisions, and then the editor tells you, we look forward to receiving your revision. That's not a lot of help. Another thing to bear in mind is, well, who actually do these reviews? The reviewers are merely other researchers in the field. So sometimes I hear my own doctoral students saying, well, I submitted my manuscript uh, three weeks ago and I haven't heard anything back yet. Well, undertaking a review is actually a quite time-consuming task if you want to do the job properly, right? Um, and also reviewers, they don't get paid to do this job. It's something that we all do, of course, because we want to advance the field. And, and as a reviewer, when you begin to work as a reviewer, you sometimes often actually do get really interesting stuff to read. And not unimportant, I mean, we know that if no one did this, there wouldn't be anyone to review our own papers either. So that's also just uh, how things are. Now, say that you reach the point of having to revise your paper, um, then how do you actually then use the reviews? Well, of course, the good constructive reviews are very easy to use, right? I mean, because they tell you what to do, or maybe the editor has told you what to do. But sometimes, from the less good reviews, there can actually also be information that is quite useful. So if, for example, the reviewer has completely misunderstood your paper or aspect of it, and of course you are not happy about this, but it could also be because you did not explain well enough what you were doing or where you came from or what was the setting of your study. Or maybe there were things that you took for granted that needed to be explained to the reader. A good reviewer realizes this and points it out, but um, sometimes when doing revisions you can actually uh, use less good reviews also to, uh, to see if there are things you need to explain better. And then when you actually do resubmit your paper or submit your revisions, you should write a revision letter. So there is a, a paper here called Perspectives from Overworked and Unpaid Reviewers, where you can see it from their side of the fence, and they say, you not only need to make nearly all the revisions suggested, but describe the revisions made and how they were responsive to the reviewers. Your chances of acceptance in the next round greatly decreases if you refuse to make many of the changes and claim the reviewers did not know what they were talking about. Vague and broad responses such as the manuscript is now much improved won't cut it either. Your responses need to be very specific and thorough. Consider presenting your responses to reviewers in a table format. So what they're saying here is that in order to actually get accepted, you should make an, after having completed your paper, you should make another effort of making it easy for the editor and perhaps the reviewers who are asked to re-review your paper to see what you have done, which changes you have made, and how you have tried to uh, take into account what the reviewers asked you to do and what they suggested. And a table format for doing this with reviewers' comments on the left and your, an account for your own changes on the right is an easy way of doing this. So the next question for you, have you tried to first get a paper accepted with major revisions and then rejected upon submitting your revised version. It's poll five. Uh, 
box to your left. Yeah, it seems that some of us have indeed tried that. And it's not uncommon. You, I think you experience it from some journals uh, more than from others. But uh, yeah, it's just, but this is just to say that even if, though you have a paper that is accepted with major revision, it's not necessarily the same as the paper is published because what you consider to be sufficient for major revisions is not necessarily the same as what the editor and reviewers think is needed. And then you get your paper rejected if that's the case. And of course, that is never fun. So to some extent, maybe uh, this can be described with the five stages of grief. I mean, as you can see on this image, they can also apparently be applied to Xbox One. But what I uh, seem to have come to experience uh, as getting older in this field is that you, when you have more experience, you more or less skip the denial phase, go straight to anger, and then you stay there for a very long time. And finally, maybe one day you just accept it. But how do you deal with a rejection? Well, this is just my personal advice to you. You can take it or leave it. But the first thing you can do is to read this paper by Trafimo and Rice. It is a very fun paper called What if Social Scientists Had Reviewed Great Scientist Works in the Past? What they do is that they take uh, Newton's theory, Einstein's theory, and then imagine what if these had been submitted to social science journals and the kind of uh, responses they would have gotten. It's quite fun. And it makes you feel better. At least it made me feel better and still does. And then you can remember that also professors get their papers rejected from time to time, not only young researchers. And then once you have reached the stage of uh, being less angry, it's a good idea to reread the reviews and see which parts you can actually use for revising your manuscript and improving it. And then submit an improved version to a different journal. On the positive side, you don't have to write a long letter of revision this time. So, now the final round of questions. We have one question here that asks, can conference publications be open access to, accessible to everyone on the web? How do I make my conference presentation open access? Well, this differs from, <coughs> from conference to conference. Also, whether or not they uh, publish proceedings, I would say. What a lot of people do is that they make their uh, presentations and publications available on ResearchGate. And that's also, of course, the place to find many things for that reason. Are there other questions? related to this part three. Not really? Okay.
Or are there any questions in general related to, to the topic of this webinar? Some of the references that uh, were presented on the slides have been shared with you, those that are uh, open access. And it should be possible for you to find some of the others if you want to see them. So now that I see there are some questions here. <coughs> One of you asked, where can we find the acceptance time for each journal? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, some journals list this on their web pages. Um, Uh, another possibility is to, when you look at some of the papers published in the journals, to see when they were first submitted and when they were finally accepted for publication. That can sometimes give you an idea about the, the turnover time. Um, and other than that, I mean, what you can do is probably to share this information with each other once you know. That's what my colleagues and I do, at least. And then there is a question here asking how to know if a rejected paper has a potential. Well, yes, that's not an easy one. I mean, but papers can be rejected for, for several reasons, right? Maybe the paper is simply immature, right? Um, and sometimes papers, I mean, some papers do actually need more empirical studies. So that's one way of maybe maturing them prior to publication. Um, and possibly it's also a good idea to discuss this with your, with your supervisor, if you are still a doctoral student, or with some of your colleagues, if you are a postdoc. And there's another question. It says, it was a very interesting and helpful talk. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Are there any other questions that you want to ask? Because otherwise, I think we are possibly nearing the end then. Yes. Uh, so I have a, let me say a, a, a few things about the final slides and then I'll give the word to you, Dorota. Is that okay? Yes, very good. Okay, so um, here are a couple of, a few more references you might want to look at. So Jeremy Kilpatrick was uh, once the editor for JRME and he was a visiting professor in in Sweden back in the 90s, and he has a paper called Staking Claims. So that discusses what um, <clears throat> what does it actually require to do research in mathematics education, and also to some extent how to get published. Uh, Montnitz has another paper from Nomad discussing what is quality in a PhD dissertation in mathematics education. That can be an interesting paper for some of you, perhaps. And I was once asked by uh, Lin English and Barat Sriaman to write a book review um, on this book called Theories in Mathematics Education. I did that while I was still myself a young researcher. So this is a young researcher perspective on uh, the role of theories in mathematics education. And other than that, I would just like to say thank you for your participation. So, Dorota, the word is yours. Yes. Um, so, um, on, on, on behalf of myself and Andrea Mafia, and uh, our technical support in Dylan from Germany, we would like to thank you for your presentation.
like you already can see, we received um, comments and, and, and thanks, and we really do believe that uh, your talk have been very good help, helpful talk uh, for young researchers to get insights about what is actually happening when you send in your paper and what is happening before you're actually supposed to do it. So thank you very much for your, uh, for your talk and your time. Uh, thank you very much for all you who took time to participate in our webinar. Uh, please be good and spread the good words to your colleagues and young researchers in mass education and your supervisors and all the experienced senior researchers and, uh, and invite, we invite you to, uh, to go to our um, YouTube channel to our social media networking, where our goal is to get in contact and uh, with young researchers and build a community around, uh, around it. So we can meet in present at conferences and also meet at, at, uh, at this kind of event like a webinar. So thank you very much for all of you who participate. So what happens now is that we are going to close the room. Uh, all the participants are going to be uh, locked out. So thank you very much and see you next time.